I'm John Allen, no trained historian, but I have served on the board of directors of the League of American Bicyclists and explored League history. I understand that little has been written about the League in the 20th century. I will hit some highlights here in the hope to point the way to further research. From a peak membership of more than 102,000 in 1898, the League declined to 77,000 in 1900 and only 8,700 in 1902. Following the bicycle boom of the mid-1890s, a collapsed bicycle industry could not support the League. The League lost its racing constituency as amateur racing declined and pro racing grew. Motor vehicles had not driven bicyclists off the roads, but recreational bicycling had lost its appeal to wealthy hobbyists. In 1902, the League dissolved the same year the American Automobile Association was founded. The AAA performed similar functions for members, for example, providing maps. The League's secretary, Abbott Bassett, published a monthly bulletin out of his office until his death in 1924. The wheelmen, hobbyists of today, keep 19th century cycling in the public eye. Recreational bicycle club activity revived and was particularly strong in the Chicago area during the Great Depression of the 1930s. Efforts at reorganization came first from the bicycle industry. The trade magazine, American Bicyclist and Motorcyclist, began publishing a League of American Wheelmen section when there was still no league and so no league content. This League of American Wheelmen section from a 1936 issue describes an industry-sponsored bicycle day in Denver. And another in Cleveland, with exhibits and races. The League revived as an organization of bicyclists from 1939 to 1955. Most of my information on this period is from the collection of Phyllis Harmon, who was inducted into the Bicycle Hall of Fame in October 2009. I have been fortunate to be a guest at her home. Here, from Phyllis's collection, is the first bulletin calling for the revival of the League in 1939. The League adopted a formal constitution at a meeting on April 18th and 19th, 1942. But already by June 1940, the American Bicyclist and Motorcyclist League section was being generated by the League itself. A similar mailing, but also including club news, went separately to League members. A dinner in May 1940 celebrated the 60th anniversary of the founding. There was a dance, a bicycle pageant, and a fashion show with antique bicycles from the Schwinn collection. Bicycling, the official magazine in the mid-1940s of the racing organization, the Amateur Bicycle League of America, also published a League of American Wheelmen section, sharing content with the mailing, but formatted differently. Phyllis's name appears on the masthead of bicycling as associate editor, along with others representing American youth hostels and the ABL of A. Notice also here an example of club cyclists campaigning to maintain rights to the road. While the advocacy interests of the 19th century league coincided easily with those of the industry, by the 1940s, many bicyclists, 
industry and government leaders favored separate bikeways. The bikeways debate has been a recurring theme in league history. An important annual event in the Chicago area for a decade was the Jack Hansen Day, a large picnic for members of the bicycle clubs, paid for by Mr. Hansen, who was president of the Chicago Cycle Supply Company. Clubs held frequent rides. This is the Kino Cycle Club of Kenosha, Wisconsin, on a century run, and there's a nice 8 by 10 inch print of the same photo, too, in Phyllis's collection. The cycle train was a precursor of today's mass urban rides, a promotional tool for the clubs and the industry. A special chartered train would take a large number of bicyclists out into the countryside to go on a ride together, with a motorized police escort, and typically with a picnic in a park. Many participants were not club members or even avid cyclists, and some rode rental bicycles. Cycle trains would typically run a couple of times per year in the Chicago area. This 128-page booklet from 1947 includes a brief history of the League. The booklet tellingly describes bicycle club activity, century runs, cycle trains, youth hostel trips, and rallies, but not bicycling by adults for transportation. The booklet has several pages about children's bicycling, attempts to establish a youth league of American bicyclists, and attempts to educate children in safe riding. In 1950, 3,000 copies of this booklet still remained on hand while 37 sold. The board of the league voted to distribute the remaining copies for free, heralding a disturbing trend for the league. This is the group photo of the league's 1950 annual convention. By 1945, the league had 614 paid memberships, of which 61 were individual memberships and 200 more honorary members in the armed services. Membership probably increased somewhat following the Second World War, but in 1950, the League had only 23 bicycle clubs with 436 members and 507 members in all. By 1953, there were only about 250 members. Harmon explains that the number of motor vehicles had greatly increased while roads had not yet been widened. John Forrester, later the president of a revived league, describes how bicycling had become regarded by the population at large as a children's activity and an indicator of low social status. This telling photo feeds my suspicion that the post-war baby boom was a precipitating factor in the decline of the league. The League dissolved in 1955. For ten years, according to Harmon, it existed only as an untouched bank account. Some issues of American bicyclists and motorcyclists still included League pages, maybe with some claim to legitimacy. The claimed 77 years of publication reflect the founding date of one of the magazines this magazine subsumed. 1930s issues claim founding in 1895. Here's the one league page from the October 1956 issue, a placeholder with no actual league content. And in this 1958 issue, only the cover carried any league content. In 1965, former leaders revived the league rather than to allow the bank account to go into foreclosure. 
By 1967, the league already had more members than in 1950. This is a flyer for the memorable 1969 rally held at an inn in Rockport, Massachusetts. Dr. Paul Dudley White, a pioneer advocate of cardiac fitness and formerly President Eisenhower's personal physician, addressed the rally. This photo, with his wife at the left and Phyllis at the right, is from Phyllis's collection. Responding to the bike boom of the early 1970s, the Bicycle Manufacturers Association paid the league to hire a professional executive director, Morgan Groves. He attempted to recruit the masses of people who purchased low-end bicycles and budgeted accordingly. Club cyclists did not buy these bicycles, and those who bought them didn't join clubs. The effort bankrupted the league. Groves resigned under pressure. The directors, now including John Forrester, pitched in to keep the league going. In 1979, the league's staff resigned, unhappy with Harmon's supervision. Christine Maynor, a capable and personable young woman who happened to be attending the board meeting, was hired to move the office from Illinois to Baltimore and to serve as administrator. As membership grew, the League established a pattern of holding rallies on college campuses in collaboration with a local bicycle club. About 20% of the League's membership attended a rally in any given year. One of the most memorable rallies was a centennial celebration held at the University of Rhode Island in 1980. This is the rally poster with a familiar photo from 100 years earlier. A monument to the League was dedicated at Fort Adams Park in Newport. The League's outgoing and incoming presidents, John Forrester and Jim Fulton, are at the center and right in this photo. Forrester had strongly advanced the right to use the roads, turned his education program Effective Cycling over to the League, and sought openness in League operations. He states, quote, I wanted to develop a corporate esprit among League members, such as had existed among the members of the Cyclists Touring Club, end quote, that is, in the UK. Walter Ezell, hired as editor of the LAW Bulletin, and art director Mary Alice Rath upgraded it into a real magazine. However, Forrester's blunt and often abrasive personal style rubbed many directors on the board the wrong way, and some disagreed with his policies. He was president only for a year. In this photo from the Centennial Rally shot on the Jamestown Bridge over Narragansett Bay, the woman in the lower left is Garnett McDonough, a member of the board. McDonough, an attorney from Ohio and bikeway advocate, followed Fulton as president and appointed interim directors to fill several empty seats. Contrary to Forrester's interpretation of the bylaws, McDonough postponed elections in their districts till the ends of the terms of the directors who had left, and her faction came to control the board. Staffer Ralph Hirsch's advocacy program had been effective in establishing a volunteer base of legislative representatives to mobilize League members and getting bicycling provisions written into federal legislation. But Forrester reports that Hirsch improperly used League funds to set up a new organization, the California Bicycle Coalition, to support bikeway advocate Ellen Fletcher, who opposed Forrester in the 1983 election. She defeated Forrester, but Hirsch precipitously resigned during a board meeting, Forrester's last. McDonough declared the issue of impropriety moot and it was removed from the agenda. The League had a history of starting up valuable initiatives, 
letting them drift, and then letting them get taken over. The League ignored off-road cycling and expressed outright disdain for bicycle paths and trails, which were more often then than now poorly designed and hazardous, although popular with the public. This cartoon from the League's magazine in April 1983 is emblematic of that disdain. Other organizations sprang up to fill the gaps. The Adventure Cycling Association serves bicycle tourists. The International Mountain Bike Association serves off-road cyclists. The Rails to Trails Conservancy promotes conversion of abandoned rail lines to trails. These organizations have left the League far behind in membership numbers. But, when League leaders sought to professionalize the League's management and to attract members other than avid recreational cyclists, the League shrank and got into financial trouble. In this graph, note the stagnation in membership in the mid-1970s Morgan Groves period and the drop by one-third in the mid-1980s Don Trantow period. Under McDonough and Trantow, the League adopted the trade name Bicycle USA and also for its magazine, which no longer published criticism from members. Trantow's attempt to recruit casual bicyclists included a series of arena events, the Kodak Liberty Ride Festival. Some arenas sold fewer than 10 tickets. The League nearly went bankrupt again. A League staffer wrote a memo to inform the board. Trantow found out and fired the staffer. In the end, the board dismissed Trantow and returned the League to its former name. The League then set out on a period of quiet rebuilding under office manager John Cornelison and President Steve Clark. The League reached a peak membership of 24,000 in 1996. There was another drop around the year 2000, not shown in this graph, to about 19,000. Memberships have since recovered, but remain around 20,000. The higher sets of points in the graph count family memberships as two people, the number of votes they are allotted in league elections. One notable trend was the decrease in the percentage of family memberships from about 22% in 1990 to 12% in 2003. Another trend was the shift of memberships from the east to the west and south, especially California. Massachusetts lost ground when the Charles River Wheelmen stopped being a full chapter club, that is, that all club members automatically also became league members. New York memberships also declined substantially. The most successful rallies had been in the Northeast, the Mid-Atlantic states, and the Midwest. Rallies became less successful due to geographic dispersion, among other reasons. Returning to our timeline, around 1990, the League was operating smoothly again within its chosen sphere of action of rallies and advocacy. The dynamic and energetic president, John Tarosian, established a yearly transcontinental ride called Pedal for Power to raise money, half for the League and half for another charity of a participant's choice. John is at left in the photo on the steps of the Washington State Capitol at the 1991 National Rally. The League hired another executive director, Gil Clark, in 1991. The League held a collection of thousands of books, business records, magazines, films, and photos. Tarosian pushed for a library and museum in Baltimore to be set up in space donated for $1 per year, but according to Harmon, 
the board turned the offer down. In the 90s, the effective cycling curriculum, originally organized like a 30-hour college course, was modularized to make it easier to market. Forrester disowned it, and the League renamed it as Bike Ed, and the instructors as League Cycling Instructors. Their number remained rather low, only in the hundreds, and many did not teach. Also, the League had been criticized for its name, League of American Wheelmen, and began doing business as the League of American Bicyclists in 1994. Things took a bad turn in the mid-1990s. Tarosian overstressed himself on a pedal-for-power ride and died suddenly of a heart attack. Nobody could fill his shoes. The IRS ruled that participants should have paid taxes on in-kind services. That was deemed impractical, so the tax bill fell to the league. It is reported that Clark yelled at an IRS agent. He left or was fired in 1995. The League lost members when the International Police Mountain Bike Association, a program of the League, went independent. After a year, the League hired another executive director, Cozy Simon. A former board member describes her as not having the spine to make the cuts necessary to balance the budget. The League was borrowing operating cash from its life member trust, and by 1997 it couldn't sweep the problem under the rug anymore. The financial crisis also contributed to the decrease in membership. In 1997, the board changed the bylaws to appoint four of the 12 directors. This move might be looked at from two perspectives, members being disturbed with their loss of control of the organization, or the boards needing to bring in new skills and viewpoints following a train wreck. However, adding board-selected directors contributed to a profound change in direction for the organization. The League even abandoned its winged wheel logo that it had used for 120 years for this Nike swoosh sort of thing. A former director describes the changes as follows, quote, Seems a certain executive director had a plan for moving out from under everything she didn't want to deal with, staff, paperwork, and the collective history of the organization, end quote. Jody Newman made the needed cuts and negotiated a settlement with the IRS that the League could afford. The League shed most of its member services and dropped its national volunteer base. The League moved its office from Baltimore to K Street in Washington, D.C. in the fall of 1997, although it already had a lobbyist in Washington. Newman hired inexperienced youngsters fresh out of college to replace staff who were fired or did not want to make the move. The League turned once again in the direction of industry partnership and bikeway advocacy. The Thunderhead Alliance, since renamed as the Alliance for Bicycling and Walking, took over the League's role as a clearinghouse for state and local advocacy using newly available internet communication. The D.C. office space cost about twice as much as the Baltimore space, but was smaller. There was not room for the League's library. 117 storage boxes of materials accumulated from 1965 through 1997 now reside in the basement of a League member in Pennsylvania. Former board member John Schubert, who helped move the material, contends that it would have gone into a dumpster if they hadn't rescued it. I'm going to leave off here for now, though this has been a very compressed presentation. I have made digital copies of the bulletins in Phyllis Harmon's collection, among other documents, 
and have made them available to historians. Check out the link on the screen. One of my main goals in giving this presentation at the International Cycle History Conference in 2009, and in putting it online now, is to find a home for the League's library, an invaluable resource on the history of cycling and cycling advocacy. There are members of the League's board who are also working on this. Please feel free to discuss this with us.